So I don't know if you guys know this, but I was thinking about it while I was sitting back there. I don't know if you've realized we don't sing songs on accident ever. So if you've never picked up on that, I, I wanted to point it out for you. Since I know what I'm about to say, <laughs> as I was sitting back there just listening to the words of the songs that we just sang, they were extremely powerful for me. And so I just challenge you, this is free, this has nothing to do with my message today. When you leave today, like look up the songs that we sang and listen to them again. And, and just see if God stirs something new in your heart because of what he speaks to you through what I have to say right now. So anyway, do that. Hey, and by the way, the way I chose to start my message today... I didn't know what was going to happen last night. I, I assumed last night was going to be a loss just like any other loss. I didn't know it was going to be so heartbreaking. Um, oh, come on. You thought the same thing. Anyway, so, but I did want to ask this question. Do you guys remember this, this uh, catch? Do you guys remember this? Third down. Cross to the middle. Juggle. Diving. Touchdown, Nebraska. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you might remember what that game was called or that catch was called. Anybody remember? Yeah, Miracle in Missouri. Uh, Nebraska goes on to win that game. If you're, if you're not a huge Nebraska fan, they go on to win that game and, and subsequently go on to win the national championship in 1997, the last one that they won. And, and so I thought this would be the, the best way to help you understand what I mean when I say don't forget to remember. When I, when I label this series don't forget to remember, this might help you understand. And so don't forget to remember that God has done some amazing miracles in the past and that he has the power to give the Huskers a championship again. <laughs> now, we don't actually know if he's going to do that, but he definitely, definitely has the power. Anyway, don't forget to remember it. This is actually a series to help us remember, or for some of us, actually for a lot of us, I think, to, remember, to, to learn for the first time how and why God miraculously worked in the past, both in Scripture and maybe in your life or in somebody else's life, and for us to gain the confidence we need to believe that he not only has the power to do it, but he is still working miracles today. Do you ever use the word miracle when you're describing things? I know that I have a tendency to do it often. In fact, last week my daughter got baptized. Uh, that certainly was a miracle. It was beautiful. She'd go back and watch it. You'd probably cry. Uh, but I, I remember telling somebody about Cadence's baptism, and I, and I use the phrase, man, it's a miracle my whole family was there. I, I've got a lot of kids who are busy, but I said, hey, it's a miracle my whole family was here. Maybe for you, just this morning, like as you're getting ready, your, your kids are going nuts, and you hop in the car, and you spill some coffee on yourself, or you go through the Starbucks line, and it takes forever. You sit down in your seat, you look at wh whoever you're here with, and you say, man, it's a miracle I even made it here today. You know, I would... I'd actually argue the word miracle is, is kind of losing a little bit of its luster, a little bit of its power for us today. And one of those reasons certainly could be of overuse, just like I, I just mentioned. I mean, we say things like, we, we, hey, I went to my kid's soccer game, and it's, the parking lot is so full, but I pulled up, and there was a spot right by the field. It was a miracle. No, that, that's not a miracle. Somebody else's kid got hurt, and they had to leave early, and so you got a spot. That, that is not a miracle. One other reason it's kind of losing kind of its feel for us, a, a true understanding of what it means, it might be because of unbelief. You see, we might actually say that we believe in a miracle working God, that we've seen what God has done in Scripture and we've actually seen what God has done in other people's lives, but he probably won't do it in my life or, or at least I won't experience anything like that in my life. And so unbelief causes us to, to just not really love the word or, or know what the power of the word should really mean. So what is a miracle? What's the purpose of it? Why do they happen? Why do they matter to us today? And so a miracle, a miracle is when the almighty God, the all-knowing, ever-present, the supernatural God, the God that's so big, so beyond us that I can't even believe he actually even cares to pay attention to us. When that God intervenes in a supernatural way. When God Almighty intervenes in your life in a way that the only way it can be explained is that it was a miracle from God. Now, why would he do that? Why did he do that? He did it to bring glory to himself. You see, to bring glory to God and to turn our eyes towards him. 
every miracle in scripture, every miracle in your life and every miracle in the lives of those that you love and know was about bringing glory to God because it should turn our eyes to God. When we see God do something that we can't explain, something that we can't ever do on our own, we should worship God in heaven. It should turn our eyes towards him every time. And so our main point for this series going forward over the next four weeks is this. Don't forget to remember miracles from God are about God to turn us to God. Now, you may struggle to believe in miracles. And I, I absolutely get it. In fact, like I said earlier, miracles are quite literally things that can't be explained. And, and outside of a relationship with God, probably should not even be believed. But I would venture to say that there's a ton of people that there isn't maybe not even a single person in this room who hasn't at one time hoped, prayed, begged, believed for a miracle to take place in your life or in somebody else's life. In fact, let me, how many of us in this room are currently hoping for a miracle to take place in our lives or in the lives of somebody else? Yeah, there's so many of us. So many of us want God to intervene in our life. We want this almighty, all-powerful. We may not use those words. We may want the universe to come in and do something. But we want something to come in and do something that we can't do on our own. And so then it makes sense that we would take some time together as a church to learn a little bit more about what miracles are, why they happen sometimes, and maybe most importantly for a lot of us, what does it mean when they don't happen? What, is it, what does it mean about us and, and our relationship with God and our, and our faith? How do we handle that? How do we reconcile when we've begged and pleaded and hoped for God to move and it doesn't happen? And so that's, that's what we're going to do. If you look at Scripture, I believe that you can take every miracle you see in Scripture outside of the changed and transformed life, outside of salvation. You can take every miracle that happened within Scripture and kind of fit it into four different buckets. Next week, uh, we're going to talk about miracles of healing. You see, we believe that God can and still does heal those who are sick and hurting. But as I mentioned just a moment ago, what about the times that he chooses not to? We're going to examine what our response should be to the times that God chooses to respond in a way outside of what we wanted him to. How does that impact our faith? We're going to talk about that and we're going to pray boldly that God would heal those that are in need of healing because we believe that he can and he does. And that might freak some of you out. Uh, those of you that are relatively new to church or maybe this is one of your first times here, the thought of having prayer for healing and seeing people get healed might freak you out. And it probably freaks you out because of things like this. This, this might be what you're expecting. Some of the, right? Like, like I'm going to call people up on stage and knock them over or just kind of throw my jacket at them and they'll fall over. But trust me when I say I, I don't assume any of that's going to happen. I mean, who knows, right? Who knows if that's going to happen? I don't assume for that to happen next week. But if you or someone that you love, somebody that you care deeply for, man, I challenge you to make it here next week. I challenge you to show up next week with some sense of faith, some sort of faith to believe that the God that we call a miracle working God, that he can do something in your life or in the life of someone that you love and that he can heal them. The week after that, we're going to talk about miracles of protection. You see, in our culture, we are constantly praying for God to protect us and those that we love, protect us from injury, protect my feelings, protect me from sickness, from death. But God never promised to always protect us. He does promise that he will always be with us and that he will never leave us. And therefore we can be assured that he is always giving us a plan. He's always giving us a path to walk. The week after that, the final week, we're going to talk about miracles of provision. See, throughout scripture, wherever there's a story of need, wherever need comes up in somebody's story in their life, there's a corresponding story of miraculous provision. So often we ask God to provide for our wants and our needs, but he doesn't seem to provide, at least not in the way that we'd hoped that he would. And we'll be discussing how when God guides, when he leads, he always provides. When he gives a path, he gives provision. Today, 
Today we're going to talk about maybe the least talked about kind of miracle. I think most would say that the strangest, if not the, the creepiest kind of miracle, and that's miracles of deliverance. When the almighty God of heaven steps in and does miraculous works over the forces and the powers of darkness, over the forces of evil, over the demonic and satanic forces that are taking place in our lives. And you're probably thinking this is about to get weird. In fact, you're probably thinking, hey, I skipped the sex series because I don't have time for that. And I show up today for demons. That's great. Yeah, I want demons. <laughs> if you don't believe in demons, I, I, one of my favorite quotes comes from uh, Usual Suspects, Kaiser Sose. He says this, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he doesn't exist. It wasn't actually Kaiser Sose. It was a poet. But Kaiser Sose is cooler. (laughs) To be honest, there's been plenty of times in my life where I've been right there with you. Not that I didn't believe that there were evil forces or that, that there was a devil or Satan or demons. But I lived practically like I didn't believe it. I spent most of my days pretending like it wasn't real or or simply not paying any attention to it at all Uh, until a a couple years ago. That was about a year and a half ago. Let me introduce you to my friend Richard. This is Richard. In fact, every time I see this photo, I just, there's just so much joy in my heart. You see, Richard, about 22 years ago, Richard saw something in, in me, a chubby, 21-year-old, uneducated, nobody guy um, that happened to want to work at a church. And he saw something in me. And so he hired me for my first full-time ministry position to work with him at a church in Houston. Richard was a mentor of mine. Uh, he, I was young. Uh, my wife and I had just had our first child. I, I was learning what it meant to be a husband and a father. Richard taught me how to love my wife well. In fact, to this day, I date my wife once a week because Richard taught me how to do that. Richard showed me what it meant to continue to love my wife well. Uh, Richard uh, moved up to Omaha uh, not long after we worked together there in Houston to plant a new church. And again, Richard saw something more in me. I, he saw that I could actually come up and, and, and lead this church with him. And so he hired me to move up here from, Houston, from Dallas at the time. Uh, and I moved up here and I actually lived with, with Richard and his wife and his daughter um, at the very beginning while Holly was still in Texas getting everything settled down there. And we planted a church together for about two years. And I mean, the intimacy of that, like working together to plant a new thing. And there's just so much that goes on in that. And our relationship just grew. Well, that, that church didn't end up working out. And so I took a job here and he ended up moving back to Houston and started a, a nonprofit called Attack Poverty. Attack Poverty uh, works to uh, just service the, the underprivileged, the, the lower income portions of the Houston area. And that nonprofit grew to a multi million dollar a year budget. They had headquarters in three or four different places without, within Houston. Uh, they were the hands and feet of Jesus. They didn't just go knock on doors and tell people about Jesus, they went and showed people Jesus. They had impact on Houston like no other nonprofit has ever had. And so Richard, man, he meant the world to me. And then about a year and a half ago, this happened. I got a, I got a phone call from a mutual friend, and he said, Richard died. Um, and I, I mean, that's shocking enough, right? And uh, then he went on to just kind of lay out for me the circumstances of, of how Richard died. Uh, shocked, I mean, <laughs> shocked does not begin to describe how I felt, um, what was going through my mind. I, I, there, was, there was no way to comprehend all the feelings that were coming all at once. And I was standing in the foyer, actually, when I got the phone call, and I was, just, I was pacing back and forth, and I, and I couldn't even explain to the people here at work why I was so out of it. Um, and I wanted answers so bad. Um, in fact, I, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say that for months, if not up until this day, I, I'll still Google just to see if there's more information, just something else I can know. Because our imagination wants so badly to make sense of everything. 
We want to hear that there was some sort of hidden life, that he had some second life that nobody knew about, or that he had some hidden sin or adultery issue, or that he embezzled money from his nonprofit and he just couldn't take it anymore. And so we, we want that so badly because it makes us feel safe. Because the more that we can understand and comprehend, even, even though how dark it may be, we can understand why somebody would freak out. The more we can do that, the safer that we feel. Uh, the easier it is for us to cope and to mourn and to get over something. And I'll tell you to this day, if you go and read up on any of this, there's an investigator in Sugarland, Texas who said, I've been doing this my whole life. I've seen murder, I've seen suicide, I've seen mu murder, suicide, and I've never, ever, ever seen anything like this. He said, I have no idea why this happened. There is nothing that can explain it. And so I was left with one choice, right? It's either believe that the man that I loved that led me closer to Jesus, the man that had led many, many, many hundreds of people closer to Jesus, either all of that was fake, either it meant nothing and he was lying to all of us, or that there was something else that took place, that there was something else that got a hold of him, that influenced him, that changed him in a moment that caused this to happen. Maybe you have a story like this, where no matter how crazy it sounds, how insane it sounds, that the only explanation, in fact, honestly, the only logical explanation is that there was something else, that there was an evil influence that caused whatever it was that happened in your life. I mean, hopefully, hopefully for most of us, we don't have a story anything close to this. In fact, I believe most of us will never experience kind of poltergeist type true demonic possession, right? Um, but we have things in our lives that have control over us. Uh, alcohol or any, any kind of substance or, or anxiety or depression or, or evil thoughts or pornography, the, these things that, that we let slip into our lives and then they, they begin to take control over us. And no matter what we do, no matter how many times we work to get past it, no matter how many times we struggle to get past it, we end up right back there. And you, you just can't put your finger on why. I mean, you're a disciplined person, right? Like anything that you put your mind to, you're, you're pretty good at achieving. In fact, there's been other things in your life that you would consider bad things that, you, that you've gotten over, that you've figured out how to fix. But this one thing, what's the deal with this one thing? Well, the Apostle Paul uh, the Apostle Paul wrote most of our New Testament, the second half of, of our Bible. Uh, he gives us some insight as to what actually might be happening, what actually might be going on outside of what we can see in a letter that he wrote to a church in Ephesus. And we read about it in Ephesians 6, verse 12. He says this, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, and against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So we use the word demon. Uh, scripture uses the word demon. We, we talk about Satan and demons. And so what, what even is a demon? Many people believe that a demon is, I mean, it is October, it's almost Halloween. Many people believe a demon is the spirit of the dead, right? <laughs> like, hey, I've got that, that mean Uncle Tom. He was, he was a hellraiser when he was alive and now he's dead and he's haunting me. He's a demon. No, your Uncle Tom is not a demon. It's not how it works. Uh, most of what we know about demons actually comes from uh, Isaiah 14 and Revelation 12. Most of what we know about the forces of darkness, about Satan, about demons. Isaiah 14 in the Old Testament, we see Lucifer, another word for, for the devil. Uh, he's a created being. He was created to worship God. Uh, he gets to the point where he makes what, what we see as the five I will statements. Uh, five statements where he tells God or tells uh, the people around him, the angels around him, that he is going to ascend to heaven. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly. I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high God. Those are the five I will statements that he makes. And God, as you can imagine, God says, there's no one like me. 
no one like me. And he casts Lucifer out of heaven. And as he casts Lucifer out, we see in Revelation 12, he casts one third of the angels go with him. Obviously, we have no idea what one third is, how many that is. Uh, but we can see from Isaiah 14 and Revelation 12, we can know this. There's one devil and there's many demons. One devil, many demons. What an angel is to God, a demon is to the devil. Demons do the work, the bidding, kind of the, all, the, all the hard stuff, the, the coming after you type of stuff. They, they, they are a spiritual enemy. Uh, in the dark realms, they're out there trying to destroy anything that brings joy to God. Anything that can bring joy to God, they're trying to destroy. They're trying to take people away from the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of God. And that's a whole lot, whole lot to wrap our minds around. But if you were to ask me kind of where do we get it wrong in the church, the, the global church, and, and depending on where you're from or where you grew up or what your background was, you probably fall within kind of two different camps. And, and I don't think it's just church people. I, I believe those that, that are not followers of Christ, people that aren't a part of a church, they're not exempt from kind of these, these two camps, if you will. The first one is this. We overemphasize demonic influence. There's a, there's a demon under every rock. We've heard that phrase all the time. In fact, uh, Pastor Nick, his wife Amy, I did not ask for this permission to tell the story, so hopefully she's okay with that. She is, she is the best. Like, she's the best at the demon under every rock kind of thing. Like, in fact, we were, at a, we were at a meeting as a leadership team, and Nick showed up late to the meeting. And, and then, so Amy sends a text to Ronnie saying, sorry, Nick is late. The devil wanted to keep my phone in his car. No, you forgot your phone in his car. Like that's, anyway, I love Amy. She, she's great. She always says, I want to punch the devil in the face. So anyway, people say things like, uh, uh, the devil made me broke. No, the devil didn't make you broke. You're, you suck at spending money. Like you, you made you broke. And contrary to what we all want to believe, the devil did not make you eat the whole thing. That was 100% that was your decision. The other way we get in trouble are the things that we, the other camp that we kind of fall into is we underemphasize demonic influence. Certainly not everything that goes wrong in our lives is directly caused by the devil or evil forces. But far more than we realize could be caused by the forces of darkness. And because we don't have our eyes open to see it, we blow it off as circumstantial or, or simply bad luck, which only serves to allow darkness to dig its way deeper into our lives. If we want to understand how God has worked over the powers of darkness in the past and begin to have faith to believe that he has a power to still do it today, we need to have kind of a framework, kind of a foundation for how demons work and to be able to identify their work in our lives. And here's three things that I, that I see that demons do. Demons tempt you to sin. Paul wrote again to, to Timothy, he says this, that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. In some form, in some fashion, demons will communicate to you. They'll whisper in your ear. They'll say, go ahead. Go ahead, you deserve it. Just... Just log on for a few minutes. You can have another drink. It's totally fine. Just take it. Just smoke it. Just do it. Just, just go ahead and text, text her back just this one time. Just, just have one little conversation. It's not that big a deal. Nobody's going to find out. You're never going to get caught. And so what you hear from demons is on the front side, they minimize sin. Even though you know you probably shouldn't be doing it, you hear these voices or you get these feelings or these senses that right, for, this, for this time it's, it's probably okay. And then they maximize it on the back end. Minimize sin on the front end, maximize it on the back end and say, oh, see what you did? God could never love you. You, you see how you did that? You did that again. Look what you did. He's never going to be able to use you now. So demons, they, they tempt you 
to sin. Demons distract you from God's will. Again, Paul writing to Timothy says this, the spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Some of you might know one of these type of people. Some of you might be uh, one of these type of people where there was a time where you were, man, you were walking in lockstep with Jesus. I mean, you and Jesus, you were the best of buddies. Everything he wanted you to do, you did. You were following him with all of your heart and you loved him. And then demonic spirits, deceiving spirits, evil whispered in your ear and led you away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus. It's, it's very common for us today, and, and you guys will all know people who talk like this, who think like this, where all roads lead to God. Like that, that's kind of the first little whisper that you hear, and you're like, no, I, I love Jesus. Jesus is the only way I get it. No, no, it's okay. Maybe just take a little bit of this, a little bit of Buddhism, a little bit of new age. I, I kind of like the idea of this mysticism stuff. It's really kind of fun to think that I could figure some stuff out that way. We wouldn't use this word, most of us, but a little bit of witchcraft, a little, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And they tell you, hey, most of the Bible, I mean, it's, it can't possibly all be true anyway. It certainly can't be accurate to history. So just take the parts that you like, make your own path, you'll be fine. It's your life, live it how you want, and eventually you find yourself on a path that leads you away from Jesus and not towards him. Demons distract you from God's will. Demons inflict suffering. We read about this story in Matthew of Jesus. A man walks up to Jesus and says, Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire, into the water. And Jesus said, bring the boy here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. One of my favorite things about reading through the Gospels uh, is when Jesus is confronted by an evil spirit. And if you read through it, you'll see it over and over and over again. The moment Jesus walks into a room, the moment somebody with an evil, uh, demonic spirit inside of them walks in the room, they recognize Jesus like that. And they speak directly to him because they know who he is. And what do we know about Jesus? That Jesus came to give life. That he came to give life to the full. That he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. That he didn't come for the healthy but he came for the sick. He didn't come for the self-righteous. He came for the sinner. He came to set people free. He came to deliver us from darkness. And what we know about Satan and his mission, his only mission is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. See, demons, they may influence depression, they may influence suicidal thoughts or thoughts of desperation and anxiety. They speak whispers into your mind. Satan wants to destroy your marriage. Satan wants to ruin your testimony. Satan wanted to ruin Richard's testimony. Satan wants to wreck your finances. There's no joke. He wants to obliterate your health. Satan, he wants to crush your children. If he can crush your children, he knows he can get to you. Satan wants to crush your children. This isn't a game. It's not a game. It's not a joke. This isn't some cute little red guy with a tail and some horns. This is the prince of darkness. This is the forces of evil that hate God. They hate God and the kingdom of light and his mission with every demonic spirit is to hurt what matters most to the heart of God. And nothing matters most to the heart of God than you. You matter more than anything. And so you're the prime target. And we don't get to turn a blind eye to it. 
just because we don't understand it or it seems freaky or weird. You want demons to continue to have influence over your life? Keep living like they don't exist. That's the easiest way. Walk out of this room today, pretend like everything I said is stupid, continue to live like they don't exist, and they will have control over your life. But what do we do? What do we do with those who are followers of Jesus, those who are yet to be followers of Jesus? What do we do when we identify that we are actually in a spiritual battle? If anything I say today actually speaks into your heart and you begin to believe that maybe there's something going on beyond what we can see, what do we do? For those of us who are followers of Jesus, I have some of the best news for you than you're ever going to hear. As a follower of Jesus, if you are in Christ and he is in you, you have miraculous authority over darkness in the name of Jesus. If you are in Jesus, you have miraculous authority over darkness in the name of Jesus. So as we fight this battle... As we fight this battle in the unseen against the mighty powers in the dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places, as we fight this battle, we need to recognize that we are not fighting with our power. But we are fighting with the power of Jesus. In fact, we read in multiple places, multiple accounts of the same story in the gospel where Jesus calls together his disciples. This is actually pretty early on in Jesus' ministry, which kind of blows my mind when you think about that. He calls them together and he gives them the authority to cast out demons and to heal sickness and every disease. And so early on in Jesus' ministry, he takes his disciples, he gives them authority, and he sends them out. These are young boys. They've been with Jesus for a short period of time, and yet he gives them the authority they need to walk out and cast out demons. And so that's what they do. They go from town to town, healing the sick, performing miracles of deliverance over darkness, not because of their own power. They didn't have any power. But because of the power and the authority bestowed upon them by Jesus. And if you are a disciple of Jesus, if you've asked Jesus to be the forgiver of your sins and the leader of life, you have that same miraculous authority today. Just step back a little bit. This all sounds weird. I, I'm fine with that. I get it. That there's stuff going on that we can't see, that there's battles behind the scenes. Uh, and beyond that, it's just so hard for us to actually remember and live our lives like it's going on. Most of the time, we're just trying to make it through the day, right? Pay our bills, clean the house, get the kids to where they need to go, get home, go to bed, wake up, do the same thing. And in the mundane, we become blind to the reality that there is a real and present enemy that is daily trying to drive a wedge between me and my wife. Just a little bit of a time. Just skipping one date night this week, it's fine, don't worry about it. Just one little bit of a time to drive a wedge between me and my wife. That the forces of evil are not just trying to hurt my kids, but they're trying to destroy my kids. That there are demonic forces that want me, that want you dependent on some other substance. That want you dependent on some other, the next lustful image, just to make it through the day because it takes your eyes off of him. And demons are opportunistic. And trust me, they're willing to play the long game. And every moment of every day, they are looking for the slightest opening to dig their way in and begin influencing you away from the things of God. And throughout the New Testament, we see Jesus and his disciples perform many miracles of deliverance. And because of Jesus' authority bestowed upon you, as a follower of Jesus, you also possess all the power and authority required to experience those same miracles today. And I've got three things, three things that I think will help us remember how to do that. First one is identify the influence. Identify the thing in your life where the enemy can have influence over you. And I've got two things for you. Don't assume every problem is a result of demonic influence. Don't assume that everything going on in your life is because there's a demon doing it. Trust me, we're pretty good at screwing things up ourselves. But also don't assume every problem isn't. Have your eyes open to what the forces of evil, what your enemy may, may be doing to try and destroy you. The second one, the second one's kind of funny, but I wanted you to remember it. Obliterate the opportunity. Obliterate the opportunity. Oh, and oh, you get it? Obliterate the opportunity. 
If you've lived life long enough, you're well aware that not every problem in our lives is caused by demonic forces like I just talked about. But your enemy is opportunistic. He will use anything to bring you down. He may not have made you do it initially, but once he sees that it's something in your life that he can grab hold of, he's coming after it. Flee from the traps that you have identified and any possible opportunity that the enemy may have. And finally, the third thing is pray with power. Anytime you have a problem or, or a new battle or temptation, a, a trial, or you identify a potential demonic influence, let me encourage you, do what's natural. Do what's natural and wise. And pray for the supernatural intervention of a miracle working God. If you're battling anxiety or depression, man, go find a good doctor. Go find a good doctor who can get you the medication that you need to, to work through your anxiety and your depression and pray in the name that is above every name. Pray in the name of Jesus for deliverance from the anxiety and the depression that you struggle with. If you or a loved one is battling with alcohol or substance abuse, 12-step program all day long. Go. Be at every meeting. Be there. Do what's natural. And pray with power and authority for the spiritual victory that you can claim in the name of Jesus. That he would keep away from you the demonic influence that keeps pushing you towards that substance. This is what we do. We do what we know to do. And... We invoke a power that goes beyond all that we could ever know to do. Because we believe that God has the power to continue working miracles. When Jesus rose from the dead, he defeated darkness. And as a follower of Christ, you have authority over darkness in the name of Jesus. Most people think of darkness as the opposite of light. Darkness is not the opposite of light. Darkness is the absence of light. One of the metaphors for Jesus is that Jesus is the light of the world. And if Jesus is in, in you, then that light dwells within you. John 1.5 says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has no power to overcome it. At any time there's spiritual darkness and you walk in the room, light walks in the room. And light always defeats darkness. It, if you are in Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus, you already possess everything you need to be victorious over the powers of darkness and demonic influence in your life. Does, does that mean the battle's over? <laughs> Certainly not. In fact, it may get harder. But every time there's a new battle, every time there's a new temptation, take authority. Say it out loud. I take authority over this darkness in the name of Jesus. Because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Church, you have to know, we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. We've already won. If you are a follower of Jesus, you've already won. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Let me tell you, if you've yet to put your faith in Jesus, if this is one of your first times here, if you're watching online, you're just logging on for the first time, but there's something stirring in your heart, let me blow you away that is the almighty God performing a miracle in you at this moment. He is performing a miracle of deliverance for you at this moment. You are being drawn out of darkness. The almighty God of heaven is opening your eyes to new things. Things that you haven't seen, maybe haven't believed before. But let me tell you, you aren't doing anything. Those of you that follow Jesus, myself, we didn't do anything. In fact, Ephesians 2 tells us, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, that we were dead in our transgressions. We, we lived by the ways of this world. We were following the promptings and the leading 
of evil and demonic forces, but because of his great love for you and for us, he is raising us out of darkness. He is delivering us from darkness. This miracle of deliverance is a gift. His name is Jesus. All you have to do is continue to let God stir in your heart. Continue to let him move you out of darkness and into light. Accept the free gift of Jesus by putting your faith in him and asking him to lead your life. Would you experience that miracle this morning? Let me pray. God, I'm so, so grateful that you continue to work miracles at all. Uh, that you care enough about us, that you see us, that you know us in such an intimate way that you can step in and intervene in our lives in a way that we could never do by ourselves. God, for those in the room who, who might be stirred towards you, uh, that walked in the room not believing, but now maybe they are beginning to believe. God, I pray that you would come and capture their hearts this morning, that they would put their faith in you, that they would ask Jesus to forgive their sins, to lead their lives. Father, we love you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.